Mulweni, Sambonani, Valkom, welcome to this place and to this gathering. Tawedes would have been the greeting that the original people of this land may have used to warmly welcome you to this space. They were the first people who inhabited this little spot of land we call the Western Cape now, but they called it Kamirori Chais, the place of the stars, in Yenkwenkwezi. And in many ways, what we are celebrating today is some kind of enlightenment, because I think that the kind of light that they saw vulnerability to conquest is a story that bears telling and retelling. And as we do so to increasingly value that story differently. But even as we gather today in this very moment, we recall too just how often we have learned our modern craft of healing at the expense of those who are vulnerable. So much of our learning in a modern age is inscribed on the bodies of the vulnerable. Those who have no voice to stop us in our quest for learning, even if it comes from a novice student. But I believe, and we reflect on that today, simulation offers us a different way. And in a paper by Paul Bradley, when he discussed simulation as the technique of imitating the behavior or some, of some situation or process, where the economic, military, mechanical, and I'd like to add health there as well, by means of a suitably analogous situation or apparatus, especially for the purpose of learning, of study or personnel training. And I'm quite intrigued at that idea of both the study and the, the training of people. I think these are, 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 are connected. And he speaks as well in that paper of how Simulation in and of itself has shifted from being a resuscitation training um, methodology to something that is increasingly challenging the way we think about the whole system of education. But increasingly, I think we're recognizing the role of, of simulation in interprofessional education. And in a paper by Palaganis and, and others, they speak about the fact that Healthcare in and of itself is a team game. It's a team sport. And because of the hierarchies that are inherent in that team, we don't always recognize the significant roles that all the different professions are playing. And what simulation allows us to do is to create these environments in which we can allow each profession to express themselves in a particular way. In the Amy Guide of 2013, uh, the authors speak about this idea of what's the evidence base and they begin to unpack so much of the stories that different people tell. But I thought that these five steps of developing a, a suturing skills um, workshop for first year residents are instructive. They speak about this idea of starting with the learning needs, defining the objectives and then identifying the resources for learning designing those learning experiences and strategies, and then crucially providing feedback. And I think that it's, it, it may be a thing that needs to echo more profoundly in the training programs that we have, the global training programs that we need to begin to locate in this kind of framing. Importantly, in this framework, there's very little, um, there's very, little, there's very little of an approach of we have the equipment, now what shall we do with it? That what we have to start to do is say, this is what we need to do. This equipment helps us best achieve that. And so I was saying to, to, to Gabriel earlier that in the, in the paper by Kainth, Ranjev Kainth and Gabriel Reedy, they take us on this journey of a, a systematic meta-ethnographic -eth view of what's happening with feedback and, and, and in the debriefing situation, uh, what actually is happening? And again, those insights show us that when we talk, when we situate our conversations in a particular context, they have more meaning and allow us to unpack so many more things. And in a, in a stunning graphic of all of the complexity of the relationships that happen between the simulation encounter, the clinical reality, and the the person who emerges with the professional identity that is wholesome, we recognize that simulation may play an important role in, the, in that space. 
But they speak about this idea that in their final remarks, in, in their conclusion, they speak about this process through talk happening in a socially constructed learning milieu. This recognition that in our basic interactions as, as learners and as teachers, we recognize that it is the way in which we, we talk to each other that often determines the extent of learning. And I think perhaps in, in, in the medical education literature, certainly, this idea of feedback is probably one of the few things that we can say with absolute certainty is a fundamental part of the guaranteeing of learning over time. And so into this milieu that we speak of comes the idea of share. This essential component of an Ubuntu perspective of life that is being proposed here with this organization. I, I really do want to congratulate uh, Marvin Jansen and Joe Park Ross in this process of developing a kind of African dialogue, I suppose, and in their document of motivating this, this program, being quite explicit and intentional about shifting the gaze from one that is the, the, the kind of patriarchal Northern gaze telling us always what to do to reconfiguring those conversations to be more emergent and more uh, uh, dialogical in the people that we engage. But they, their vision that they, they, they express is this building capacity of health workers, educators and leaders through simulation based education, research, training and network, I think is an essential component of how we can reconfigure ourselves as Africans and acknowledging that our partnerships across the continent may be far more important than our, our partnerships with the global north. They're not mutually exclusive. I, I think they're co-creating and certainly what, what one can see in the, in the more modern literature around um, uh, the work in education is about this co-creation. So no comments from me would be complete without my quoting Roger Niebaum, um, having heard him some many years ago first talk about uh, the Ha Ha War, which is a construct from an English country garden which speaks about when often when we teach, we cannot see the barrier that the learner sees. And in many ways, simulation helps us to deconstruct that. But he says in, in a paper that he's written with Mo Ruth Morgan and others, he speaks about regaining creativity in science, insights from conversation. And for me, the key words there are creativity and conversation. But he, he speaks about this, side, or they speak about this idea that there are three challenges in re-establishing a culture of creativity in science. He really speaks about how, we com how scientists communicate what science is and what it is for, what scientists value, and, and third, how scientists create and co-create science with and for society. He speaks also about this open-ended sense of conversation, which I really do believe to you who, who are engaged in the SHARE initiative. What I think your organization is asking me and others in, in my position is what if we would do things differently? And so what Roger Nivon and his team are saying is that if we are to generate the science of conversation as integral uh, to how we move forward, we've got to keep asking ourselves the question of what if we did it differently? What if we changed our perspective? So congratulations to those of you who have organized this launch. Uh, it, it's a phenomenal idea, and I look forward to engaging this afternoon as we go along. I, I call on Joe Park Ross to take over now. Uh, thank you, Pa, for your kind words. Um, welcome to those of you in person and online. Uh, it's an amazing opportunity to be able to launch the SHARE initiative with you today. Uh, and before I start, I just want to say that I stand up here as a, a short representative of a bigger group of people who've worked very hard to bring a very large vision together. Um, so uh, I don't normally have notes for presentations, but when 340 of you signed up online to attend, uh, you put me a bit on the back foot, so you'll excuse me if I sometimes look at my notes. Uh, but a huge welcome to you all. Uh, when we put out this advert, we had, uh, I mean, uh, more emails than I could keep up with and um, signups from 340 people from 18 African countries and six continents. And I think that really shows the uh, fertility of the ground and the interest in simulation. Uh, and we're here to plant seeds and we're ready to watch you grow. So uh, a big welcome. Thank you to uh, 
Professor Lionel Green Thompson for opening and welcome to our keynote speaker, uh, Gabe Reedy, who crossed an ocean to be with here with us today. And before I start uh, and introduce myself, I just want to be clear that SHARE is an, an invitation uh, and we, we love that we managed to get the name SHARE to work because we think that's what it is. It's an opportunity uh, for collaboration and an invitation to you and those like you uh, to come and be with us. Uh, my name is Joe Park Ross. Uh, I'm a critical care paramedic by background. Um, and when I think of African healthcare, uh, I think of growing up in rural Malawi and relying on a healthcare system when I had malaria 10 times before I was 10. Uh, I think of traveling the continent as a flight paramedic and picking up patients from province to province and experiencing totally different healthcare systems uh, and standards and equipment and knowing that we could do better and that we could care for people better. So uh, Lionel has already um, lovingly shared our vision, which is to build capacity in healthcare workers and educators, and specifically leaders. We're, we're looking to collaborate with leaders. We would like to see simulation-based education, research and training, capacitate uh, those around us to transform and improve healthcare education and clinical care. We know that there are barriers to simulation uh, across Africa. We know that uh, a lot of this comes from uh, challenges related to cost, faculty development, faculty availability, access to learners, um, funds and time. But what we want to show you this, uh, this afternoon is examples of how that doesn't really seem to be able to stop us. Uh, one of the things that has struck us as we have gone through the process of developing SHARE has been the call to action uh, to help others. We ran a, a faculty development program in June this year and um, one of the faculty when we asked her, one of the uh, participants when we asked her, why are you interested in simulation? She said, well, I, I'll be the second neonatologist in Ghana uh, and I would like to know how I can uh, disseminate information. How do I take people who are have limited neonatology training and create a, a safe system for my country? And just for context, uh, Ghana has 32.8 million people in it, mostly not neonates, I'm sure. But, um, you know, that's that's the weight of the of the responsibility. We understand that the challenge in healthcare uh, across our continent is both capacity, but the ability to specialize and that those returning home deserve uh, the opportunity to learn how to educate. So why simulation and, and what is it? Why are we so passionate about it? So we can read you a lot of uh, long winded definitions, but the definition that we like, the definition that my colleague Rowan Dace loves, is that it's learning through experience without harming patients. Uh, when we talk about simulation, when I ask people what they think it is, um, there's a, lots of modalities. We can talk about everything from uh, tabletop paper-based simulation all the way through to high tech. Uh, and in the middle of there is something really magical that we can use to transform our healthcare systems. And to be clear, simulation is a transformational pedagogy. We are putting ourselves in spaces where we center the learners as critical in their own learning, where we ask them to reflect on their spaces and create the opportunity and space for transformational conversation, which can happen within our education systems and within healthcare. And don't we so badly need it? When we run our faculty development programs, we center the Jedi principles, not the Star Wars ones you're used to, um, but justice, equity, diversity, inclusion. And we're excited to share with you these opportunities to transform the way that we teach, the way that we give feedback, the way that we are handled when we are uh, in the wrong, when we have made a mistake. And we're hoping for a generation of students, a pipeline of students who have experienced an opportunity to give better feedback, to receive better feedback uh, and better listening skills. And to be clear, uh, it's possible if we were stretching our imagination that simulation originated in Africa. If we think of our ancestors uh, out in the grasslands, uh, do you think that they were using their precious bows and arrows on the animals passing them for the first time? No, they were probably simulating and trying a bunch of times before attempting the real game. Um, and I, I think one of the, before I stop talking about what simulation is and start showing you some beautiful stories, I just want to pause and say, I think that um, what I'm hoping is not that we can learn from the rest of the world. I, I would love us to showcase what we have to offer, but also for 
asked to take in some opportunities from the international community. We have a problem with faculty development. We have a problem with faculty availability. You know, systems all over the world using undergrads to lead and dictate their curriculum and to teach it. Wouldn't that be beautiful? Um, we have an opportunity to show the world what a, an incredible educational program you can run with really low technology equipment. The simulation literature is rapidly growing and we need to contribute to it. We need to not be absorbing. We have a voice. We have things that are worth sharing. Uh, so it's time. So one of the things that we need to take from the simulation literature is opportunities like uh, in the NHS, they can show that they can, uh, if we have a consistent program, we can decrease error and decrease medical legal claims. There's evidence that uh, being simulation faculty increases the longevity of your career and your job satisfaction. Don't we all want that? Um, and that we can really embed uh, improved clinical reasoning within our programs. I think that um, if you spend a little bit of time on social media uh, and you explore a little bit and you find some programs worth watching, uh, I want to encourage you to to really uh, start journeying and creating community. And one of the most exciting things I've ever seen is from Leonid Dyer from Cameroon. 2010, the bark of a banana tree. 2018, a sponge. 2022, silicone. So their own homemade uh, skills trainers. We are Africans, we innovate. It's different and it's better. OK, so the, uh, <laughs> the four pillars of the uh, share initiative are research edu and education, which I'll be speaking about, and my colleague Marvin will tell you about our network and community initiatives and our innovation hub. We understand from our efforts that uh, there is a definite need for improved access to faculty development opportunities. And so here is how we plan to answer that call. Uh, a huge faculty development focus, partly through short courses, um, we currently run a two day simulation launch pad, which is our faculty development course, and I'll tell you a little bit about that in a second. But just to say that our focus is on open access resources. We are aiming to run a, a series of educational webinars through the African Simulation Network. Um, but more importantly, we understand that a new faculty member cannot move forward alone, and so our plan is to run a, a casebook series and to produce an open access textbook. Launchpad is a um, was many years in the making uh, and myself, Marvin Janssen, Bronwyn Espen, Rebecca Gray and uh, Rowan Dace here in the room uh, came up with a two day course that aimed to take a novice practitioner, someone who had not yet had a lot of experience in simulation or in simulation teaching. And by the end of two days, they were able to run a simple clinical scenario. Uh, we are 18 months into our program. We have 74 graduates from eight countries uh, and five higher education institutions. Uh, and we've managed to gather participants from nurses, doctors, physiotherapists and clinical technologists, uh, paramedics and, and um, others. And here we are, 74 graduates in, and all we did was just start. Um, we've run it in two provinces, and we're very excited that we are now collaborating uh, between UCT, we have a, a member from Stellenbosch, and we're building faculty within the UKZN and WITS teams. We are ready for the continent, are we? Um, and then I'm just going to pause on the concept of a casebook for a little while. So. When I started as a new simulation faculty member, um, it's really time consuming. It's hard to generate cases, to create resources that are uh, worthwhile and to pilot and test. And so our aim is to create case books. So this is a, a themed book which contains simulation cases uh, from various specialties. So I'll just use my program as an example. I run a 12 week critical care in situ program. Uh, here at Krotiske and those 12 cases. Um, I went into an ICU in Malawi uh, when we were there for some work and I stood there in the middle of the ICU and realized the 12 cases I was teaching applied in that nurse led unit 100%. And I have been, um, it's been one of the highlights of my career getting this opportunity to 
create teams and a sense of belonging amongst, amongst registrars who are rotating through the ICU. So our aim with the case books is to create resources that are free uh, and contextual. So they'll be written by people who work in the setting in which they're going to be used. And we're able to use them for faculty development. So you are able to take that case and run it either uh, in an ongoing program or in an immersive short course. Uh, and the idea is that you have a community of practice from which to grow. Um, our second large uh, open access project will be the Handbook of Simulation Education, which aims to be a practical guide for simulation educators. Um, I have managed to persuade Gabriel to be my co-editor, uh, and we're really excited to create a, an open access textbook which collaborates between experts in the field and local expertise, and we invite collaborators to join us. We're planning three large sections. What is simulation? A, a really deep understanding of what it is and how we can use it, simulation design and delivery, uh, and a, a rigorous approach to <laughs> debriefing, including tools, how to implement it, and how to evaluate your debriefing in particular. And we're really, really excited uh, for where this is going. Before I move to research, I just want to acknowledge that this is all the work of a large group of collaborators again, and, and I get to stand up here, but um, it takes an absolute forest. Our second pillar to discuss is, is research. So uh, I'm going to leave, I'm not going to get into the weeds because we have a wonderful keynote about the research landscape, but our aim is to strengthen scholarship and health professions education, focusing on simulation across Africa, acknowledging that simulation is one part of health professions education and we, we cannot operate in isolation. What we would like to create is collaboration and capacity development through partnerships, learning opportunities and mentorship. Uh, and to take research and contextualize it and create context driven research that can inform the practice of others. Uh, while we don't have any funding or have any grants to offer you, we would love to help you understand the funding landscape and um, to show you where to find the grants. And why is research uh, such a focus for us? Well, I'm going to show you a beautiful infographic by Amano et al, who published uh, just last month about the difference between being an English first language uh, author and those for whom English is not their first language. If you are reading a paper, it takes you 91% more time just to read a single paper. It takes you double the time to write your paper. Your frequency of rejection is 2.6 times higher with 12 and a half more uh, revisions, and you're a lot less likely to disseminate your research. There are some gaps there that we would love to help our colleagues close, um, and we are empowered to share and to bring you collaborators and mentorship from the wonderful uh, international network that we have garnered. We'll have an opportunity for questions at the end, but without any further ado, I'm gonna invite Jason to take you through our network and our innovation hub. Thank you very much. Good afternoon, all. Um, it's a real honor and privilege for me to be here. Um, as Joyce mentioned, this is, I, I get the honor of standing here, but it's really a combination I, of, of the diligence of many, many people. So, as John mentioned, um, I would like to speak, to, I would like to talk to you about the African Simulation Network, which is our community arm. It's something that's quite near and dear to me. Um, and that's why I thought before I speak about what the African Simulation is, it's important to speak about why. So that's a photograph of me. And um, as I stand here before you as a first generation graduate, an academic and a believer of the transformative power of education, and above all, as someone profoundly inspired by the resilience and potential of our continent, Africa, I reflect on this very moment. I'm reminded of my own journey, starting from the Cape, from the Cape Flats suburb called Manenberg, with nothing more than a dream and aspirations, but wealth of hope. I remember how even the thought of attending a great institution such as this was but a distant dream. Despite these hurdles, I managed to make my, my way to university, the first in my family to do so. I remember the awe I felt stepping onto campus, the excitement as I attended my first lecture, and the pride as I and the pride as I graduated with my PhD. Over the years, as I navigated the black box of academia, 
I realized that it's much like stepping into healthcare education and more specifically into healthcare simulation from your discipline specific area. It's challenging, it's overwhelming, but so incredibly rewarding. Today, as I stand before you, uh, today I stand before you to champion a cause that mirrors this journey, the launch of the African Simulation Network. Healthcare simulation is relatively new in our continent, and just like the journey I undertook as a first generation graduate, it presents us with challenges and opportunities. Like the early days of my academic pursuit, the landscape might seem uncharted and daunting, but it is in such terrains that we find the most fertile ground for growth and innovation. Our journey may be marked with constraints on resources, but we are not constrained in spirit, in ingenuity, and in our capacity to collaborate. To collaborate. In my, if my schooling taught me one thing, it was that sharing and collaborating was not just a virtue, but a necessity for survival and for thriving. In a continent, as vast and diverse as Africa, the potential for innovation in healthcare simulation is immense. Our strength lies in our numbers, our diversity, our shared experiences. We need to tap into that to create a robust community of practice. Where knowledge is not held but shared, where resources are not hoarded but circulated, where success is not individual but collective. The African Simulation Network is a testament to that spirit. It is a platform for shared learning, for, for collaboration and for driving innovation and for creating a healthcare system that is more accessible, more effective and more equitable. As we launch the, the African Simulation Network, I implore each and every one to bring your experiences, your wisdom and your hope to this table. Let's share our knowledge, let's collaborate and let's innovate together. Let's remember that the African simulation is not just about healthcare simulation. Simulation, it's about creating a brighter future for our continent, one simulation at a time. It's about transcending boundaries, breaking barriers, and creating pathways for opportunity for future generations. Like a first year graduate stepping into academia, our journey will might be marked with challenges, but as we overcome each challenge, we will create a ripple of change a change that will echo throughout our continent and beyond. As we set forth on this journey, I'm reminded of an African proverb, one that, I've, one that has been quoted quite a few times. If you want to go fast, go alone. But if you want to go far, go together. Ladies and gentlemen, let's go far together. Let us make the African simulation a beacon of hope, innovation and collaboration. So, I thought it's important to, to reflect on what African simulation means to me. And through that, um, we really want to put out a call for everyone within the continent that feels that they have something to add to this, to this institution. It's not to this initiative. It's not an initiative that is owned by any one person or anyone's institution. It's something that we want to share and grow together. So what we actually want to do is, is essentially what we're trying to recreate is create a community of practice. Community of practice is a group of people who share common concern, a set of problems or an interest in a topic who come together to fulfill both individual and group goals. So that when I think of it, I see I see this community of practice of something that provides some level of protection. Innovation is quite new and oftentimes you are placed in situations where the stakes are quite high. So uh, the African simulation is there where we can share ideas, where, where we can come up with innovative solutions um, so that the, the resources that are so the resources that are so important in our in our in our content is not wasted. So currently, what are our plans? Um, we're going to leverage social media, um, YouTube, Twitter, Facebook. Um, so that is a community where we can engage on, ask difficult questions, share ideas, etc. What we also look to do is to have interviews with um, simulation experts um, and also showcase the centers of excellence that are across our, our continent already. And as Joe's mentioned, we also want to um, facilitate the development of open access and open, open source materials. Finally, our innovation hub. Innovation is at the heart and soul of progress, especially in the ever changing field of healthcare simulation. Our resource constraints, cultural diversities, and the sheer vastness of Africa call for innovative solutions tailored to our unique circumstances. 
The innovation arm we are launching today is a commitment to fostering such solutions. It's not just a platform, but a crucible where knowledge, experience and talent will be forged into breakthrough ideas, where every voice matters, so where every idea counts and every innovation, big or small, can lead to transformative change. So here's an example of something um, that was created, thought up and created by one of our colleagues, Rebecca. Um, what we looked at here is oftentimes we have a, a constraint of, of, of a monitor. Um, to create realism, you need a monitor. So what we did here is we just used a, or she used a, a toolbox essentially that you can get from your hardware, cut it out, and with some elastic bands and some equipment that was laying around in a department, was able to put together a, a, a monitor that now elevates a very low realist, real, um, the realism of a very low technology uh, mannequin into a high technology mannequin. So these are some of the examples that 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 we need, what we're going to be encouraged and also share um, through the African African Simulation Network. Finally, so how can you get involved? Um, as we seek to advance this initiative, we recognize the value of having local leaders or like we were to call it um, country champions to guide our efforts. This continent rich in its diversity has unique needs and strengths in each region. And who better to understand these, those nuances than champions from within those countries themselves? These champions will, will be our local advocates, the bridge between our collective efforts and specific needs of each community. They will be instrumental, instrumental in adapting our shared knowledge and innovations to local contexts, ensuring that our efforts are not only impactful, but also culturally sensitive and sustainable. So a few days we put out a call for um, individuals who, who might have an interest of being um, country champions. And within two days, this was the response. Um, so we, that call is still out there. Um, you can scan the code. If you would like to make yourself um, available to be considered for a country champion. And as I said in closing, the African simulation is about creating a, a, a community of practice. A community of practice is crucial to the development of healthcare simulation in our continent. Thank you. Wonderful honor of introducing our uh, keynote speaker. Professor Gabriel Reedy uh, is from King's College in London. Uh, he has come all the way to run a week of workshops uh, as part of our launch. And when I asked him to be how to describe him, he gave me free reign. So here I go. Uh, he's a psychologist by background, a simulation educator and researcher. He's a professor of health professions education at King's College London and runs a wonderful uh, master's program there. He's also the editor of Advances in Simulation and on the research committee for the Society for Simulation in Healthcare, which is the biggest international society and uh, is a leader and member of the European Siren Network, which is the European equivalent of their research network. But how I'd like to introduce him is as a generous mentor and sponsor. Uh, I met Gabe at a, an international conference where he didn't really know me from a bar of soap, but another mentor said, you should go meet Gabe and by the end of the conversation uh, he had agreed that uh, <laughs> I could bug him for events like this. No, uh, he had invited me onto his editorial board um, and despite the fact that I'm a two for one deal and explained to him that I would love to join his editorial board but I don't do things without Marvin, uh, we got Marvin on the phone and, and that's the start of our journey with Gabe uh, and I know that this is just a starting point. So. Um, Gabe, if you would like to come up. Thank you. Thank you, Joe. Thank you for the very kind introduction. Thank you. Thanks very much. And thank you everyone joining online and uh, everyone here today. Um, it's great to be able to work with you um, this week and also uh, you know, continue to work with uh, with colleagues over time. I'm very excited. Um, so 
um, Joe and Marvin asked me to come today to talk to you a little bit about simulation research and the landscape of simulation research. And so I'll share with you a little bit about um, sort of my perspective as a researcher, but also as someone who um, works in um, a role that kind of is a gatekeeping function. Some people think of it that way. As a journal editor, I see lots of uh, research and thought that comes through the, the simulation community. Um, and I have to think about what, how do we represent that in the, the academic literature? So I'm gonna talk a little bit about that. Um, where have we come from? What's the landscape look like and where are we going? Uh, I want to give some acknowledgement today um, to a couple of colleagues of mine who are also friends uh, and and one who's a, a mentor of mine. Um, so Deborah Nestel, who's the founding editor of the journal that that I now serve as the editor of Advances in Simulation, um, and Deborah is the editor in chief of the International Journal of Healthcare Simulation. So. Um, uh, another sort of emerging um, journal uh, and and place for simulation scholarship and research that's written and, and uh, distributed, which is fantastic. And Nicole Harder, who has been the editor in chief of clinical simulation in nursing. Nicole's based in Canada and Deborah is based in Australia. Um, so Nicole and Deborah and I um, did a similar uh, a talk with a similar flavor at uh, a, a meeting, an international meeting, fairly recently, uh, and so a lot of this, a lot of the ideas that I'm sharing with you today, we we collaborated on and and uh, worked together on. So I, I want to make sure and acknowledge them, and also uh, talk about how much I've learned from them, which is fantastic. Again, the spirit of learning and collaboration, um, I think, is is uh, one that I feel very strongly about. So. Uh, acknowledging that. So um, I've got three parts to this talk this afternoon. Um, the first is looking a little bit at the landscape, as I said, and then I'm going to explore uh, some of the themes that exist in the research that's published um, in, the, in the literature over the last year. And then I've got a, a little bit of an indulgent uh, look to the future, what I hope is the future that we have before us in, in the world of simulation. So this first part, um, as I was talking with Joe and Marvin and colleagues about what to talk about today, um, Joe, um, we're doing a research workshop tomorrow, so some of you may be able to join us for that. I raised the concept of the research compass. So Charlotte Ringstead and colleagues uh, from Denmark um, published this paper well over a decade ago uh, called the research compass. And for those of you who are familiar with the uh, health professions education literature, you may know the AMI guides. It's published as an AMI guide, so you can access it there. Um, but they call it the research compass. And uh, I think when you're, you know, kind of in, in modern world, um, compasses and maps don't feature as much as they did um, when I was a lad. But um, I think they're really helpful. It's helpful to think about how, where are we going and uh, you know, what's the landscape look like? For me, the compass is helpful because it reminds us that the world of simulation scholarship and research is more um, diverse and you can take it in different directions uh, than we often expect. So they talk about the, this notion that no matter where we're going, we have to have this center, which is our conceptual framework. And, you know, grounding the work that we're doing in um, uh, existing um, theory, existing scholarship, existing research, using that as the basis from which to set off on our on our journey. And they talk about the different types of scholarship and research that uh, are a part of the landscape, from justification studies to studies that help us uh, talk about the um, the future, predicting how things are going to work, how different aspects of, uh, uh, of, of our world work, um, to implementing 
implementing new um, ways of doing things and, and modeling new ideas. So I think it's helpful as we think about the, the landscape to, to keep the compass in mind, right? There's not just one way of studying the world. There's not just one way of studying the professions in which we work um, or how to educate the clinicians of the future uh, and develop our colleagues. There's a lot of ways we can do it. And I think the compass is one way that we can think about that. So as we think about the landscape, what does it look like? Well, hopefully it is varied. Um, and the interesting thing is, as we look at some of the scholarship and we sort of look at it in the round, we'll see that there is quite a bit of variability in it. And yet there is a lot of similarity as well. Um, and I think there's a lot for us to, to learn and some interesting directions that we can go. I think it's important to highlight that there's an absolute explosion in the quantity of research in health professions education, but specifically in simulation. So if you look at um, some key words, you can see a sort of hockey, a hockey um, stick shaped graph that goes dramatically up from the early 2000s um, through today. So things like healthcare simulation, simulated patient, virtual reality, simulation and patient safety. So from the turn of the century, you just see the, a, a dramatic increase. And um, we see that in the, uh, the, the, the number of journals that are represented in the field as well. Um, so there are more or less currently four simulation focused academic journal, peer reviewed academic journals in the field. There's a fifth that was around for a period but is no longer publishing. That's BMJ Simulation and Technology Enhanced Learning, although quite a, a, a lot of valuable work published there and it's still available online. The four that are currently in in uh, publication are advances in simulation. And Joe mentioned that I'm the editor in chief of that. Clinical simulation in nursing, which is um, uh, primarily focused on studies around simulation in nursing. The International Journal of Healthcare Simulation, which Deborah is the editor of, and simulation in healthcare. And they're aligned broadly to the main kind of professional societies for simulation. So Sim in Healthcare is, is from SSH, clinical simulation in nursing is from the North American um, Nursing Simulation Society. Advances is uh, allied to the European Society and IJOS um, to uh, the UK and Indian uh, societies. So Deborah and a couple of her colleagues did a really fascinating bibliometric uh, survey of the literature from last calendar year from 2022 and I'm going to share a little bit of, about what they found. There's a manuscript that they're working on right now that's uh, hopefully going to be published in the coming um, weeks in IJOS. Um, there were 172 research focused manuscripts around simulation that were published in those four journals last year. So 172 pieces of empirical research of one sort or another in simulation in healthcare that were published across those four journals. And you can see the breakdown from the four journals there. Clinical simulation and nursing, far and away the leader, um, which is so interesting to me because it shows, uh, I think, a few things. One is that, you know, nursing, um, the professionalization and the academic world, the world of academic nursing is really, really grown and, and matured. And there's quite a lot of research and, and lots that we're learning about simulation from a nursing perspective, which is fantastic. You can see that simulation in healthcare, which is primarily based in North America, is the second largest uh, in terms of the number of research studies that are uh, published there. And that's partly a representation of the history of the journal. It was the first academic journal in the field as well. So in looking at those 172 research articles across those four journals, um, there were some interesting statistics that uh, we pulled out. So 45%, almost half of the manuscripts had first authors based in the US. And what was um, interesting 
uh, to me was that only one of those 172 articles had a first author that was based in Africa, um, which calls, you know, calls us to kind of think about how the convert the global conversation exists and how we um, both make space for and participate in this larger the larger scholarship and research conversation. Over half of them were quantitative designs, so research that was done from a quantitative paradigm. Um, and then 17% uh, uh, were qualitative and 15% were mixed methods. 32% of the articles had students as the focus, so health profession students. So these are folks who are working at an undergraduate, you know, undergraduate level, which is interesting because um, so much of the work that we do in health professions education obviously is focused at that undergraduate level, yet we often don't look at uh, undergraduates as the kind of primary focus of our work, which is again quite interesting to me. If we look at the, we, we know, and again, most of us who are, who are here today are simulation educators. Um, so if we think about the, the variety of approaches to simulation that are available, it's interesting to see how that reflects in the literature. So about a quarter of the, of the manuscripts were focused on simulation that included uh, mannequins. So high fidelity, kind of full patient simulation, we often call it. But almost the equal number were focused on simulated patients or simulated participants, which is a real change and a real shift. We're seeing simulation using simulated participants, uh, you know, really growing in in uh, in popularity and in use, but also as the focus of our work. Over half were uh, in-person simulation activities but nearly a quarter represented some sort of online uh, or virtual simulation activity, which again is a, a massive change that's just come about in the last couple of years. So we'll, I'll, I'll talk a little bit more about that. Deborah and colleagues did a content analysis, a thematic analysis by title and abstract, and they came up with seven um, categories or seven themes that they saw in, again, these, these uh, research articles that were published last year. The largest by far was uh, simulation as, a, as an educational approach, and you might expect that, right? We're simulation educators, so we're researching how simulation is used as an educational method. Interestingly, some of the other categories also really highly represented in literature. So what about our learners? Who are they? What are they experiencing? What are they thinking about? Also, what about our faculty, right? All of us as simulation educators, we need development, we need uh, growth, we need to be trained, we need to be encouraged. Um, we need to shift our thinking from time to time as well. So that's a, you know, that's reported in the scholarship and literature. There's a theme around sort of scholarship and research, so a bit of a meta level where people are thinking about how we're doing scholarship and research in the field. Um, there's a fair amount of representation of quality improvement and policy kind of adherence. Um, there's still this theme of development of new simulators, and Marvin was showing us some examples of really interesting innovations that are happening in um, uh, in this context around uh, simulation development, simulator development. And we've got quite a lot of that that's happening uh, really around the world, various approaches to new simulators. Uh, and then quite a few reviews, and I'll, I'll give a couple of examples of those. I'm, I'm just going to highlight a few of those categories, not every category. But I'm going to draw your attention to a few research articles that I think are interesting, and I'll just briefly tell you why I think they're interesting. So that's the second part. So let's look at a couple of pieces from this category of simulation as an educational approach. How are we using simulation as an educational method? Um, so this piece is um, from Perez and colleagues uh, in the US, and they're looking at virtual simulation as a a learning tool to teach graduate nursing students to manage difficult simulations. And I, I drew this out um, for, as an example because, again, now 26%, over a quarter of the 
um, published manuscripts in the last year looked at some form of virtual simulation. Sometimes it's called tele-simulation or um, online simulation. Sometimes you'll see it represented in the literature. So this is an approach that um, was sort of adopted very quickly out of necessity during the pandemic in many places. Um, and yet it's still persisting. Uh, so social distancing and you know limitations uh, that we kind of quickly adopted during the pandemic have uh, gone away, but we're still kind of recognizing the value of um, working with learners uh, in a distributed way. So this um, paper talks about um, a particular approach, which was uh, using virtual simulations, uh, again, to support graduate nursing students as they were learning to have difficult conversations. And, and what they found was that, um, indeed, perhaps uh, unsurprisingly, you could actually do a really good job of teaching um, uh, nursing students to have challenging conversations using simulation at a distance. So some of the distance technologies that we have, like Zoom, can be marshaled in that in that effort. Um, and there's a lot of room for that, I think, which is very interesting. Um, the um, PowerPoint inevitably munges the um, uh, uh, PDF file um, just when you least expect it. So apologies for that not kind of coming up quickly, but um, Lim and colleague um, published another piece around um, technology enhanced learning cost effectiveness. Um, and in particular, they were looking at uh, virtual OSCEs and the ways in which, so OSCEs, Objective Structured Clinical Exams, which are prevalent in undergraduate health professions education, and a good kind of an interesting sim sort of approach of simulation. Often we don't think of it as part of simulation, but of course it is. We're simulating clinical practice for the purposes of assessment. Uh, and so this group in Australia and Malaysia moved some of their simulations, um, some of their OSCEs online and looked at an economic lens to help decide whether or not that, that was a valuable sort of use of resources and time. And what they found was that it was quite expensive for them to move the OSCEs online initially, um, but actually over time that investment paid off. So over two and three years they were able to see a great return on some of that investment. And I think that's interesting because we're starting to see both things like online tools being used uh, again in assessment, but also uh, how do we justify that and can we think about the things like the cost effectiveness of the simulations that we do? Um, we're all working in resource constrained environments, not all of us, but most of us. Uh, and the idea that, you know, we could use some of that investment to um, to uh, kind of build more cost effective approaches over time is really compelling for me. So what about our learners? Um, and I mentioned the one, <clears throat> excuse me, the one uh, manuscript out of 172 that came from uh, from Africa. Um, and this is uh, Stein's work uh, in Johannesburg looking at anxiety and performance in pre-hospital care simulation environments. Um, and so Stein uh, worked with colleagues there to um, do a before and, before and after assessment using the state trait anxiety inventory. Um, and uh, found that um, there was a relationship between the two, um, perhaps again, uh, un, unsurprisingly, um, but that actually um, performance, uh, there was an increased anxiety um, and uh, during simulation, it actually didn't go down over the course of their simulation. So simulation is a, a kind of like we're still worried about our performance, certainly in this cohort of students. It's it's uh, performance in simulation is analogous to performance in clinical environments. And in some cases, it's it's more um, anxiety inducing for our students than is actual clinical care. I mentioned another theme that emerged was simulation faculty. And uh, again, all of us as, as simulation educators are thinking about how we support ourselves and support our colleagues. Um, the network 
uh, more broadly, as Marvin was saying, is about developing a community of practice and how do we support and develop our colleagues? Um, so uh, Dickinson and colleagues, this is in IJOS, the International Journal of Healthcare Simulation. Um, we're looking at uh, simulated patients and their, uh, their perceptions of engagement in um, online virtual tele-simulations. Uh, so I think, again, we saw that quite a, a, a large proportion of the manuscripts published in the last year featured simulated patients. We sometimes think of simulation as using um, equipment to simulate uh, and to learn from, but actually using people and not using them, but engaging them in the process of um, creating immersive and supportive learning environments for, for our learners uh, is, is just um, really, really growing and is so valuable. We, we, we know that, that and the, the, the research is starting to show that. What this team did was looked at um, how those simulated patients experienced their work. What was it like for them to participate in uh, these online and virtual simulations? Um, and what was interesting was that these simulated patients who were doing this faculty work um, found that they were, they found it difficult, right? It's difficult to engage with an audience online. As, as we know, um, those of us who, are, who, who do online work and hybrid work, um, it's sometimes difficult. I can't look into the camera and see all of you um, out uh, around Africa who are watching this presentation. And so my eye contact is with people who are in the room. And that's, you know, as a, as a, as a speaker, that's what compels me. And, and they, they said, yeah, that's, that's our experience as well. Um, we're not always sure our learners are switched on and engaged, um, but uh, they recognize how, how important and valuable it is. And, and so that sense of, I'm gonna put my needs aside as, a, as an educator um, and recognize the potential value that happens through, um, through this virtual simulation. I mentioned that another really significant theme uh, within the literature in the last year was reviews. And, and I think what's, you, I mentioned the sort of um, hockey stick uh, of um, volumes of research. What we're tr starting to see now in the simulation research literature is there's a good 20 years of quite a lot of work, right? Quite a lot of empirical work that helps us understand how simulation is used and what can be used from it. And, and so we're getting to the point where reviews are a fantastic way of, of, of synthesizing a large body of, of literature and a large body of work. And we're starting to see that more and more in the literature. So reviews of various types, which, which look back at the literature and try and synthesize it over time. So this one is from uh, colleagues in Denmark who were exploring how simulation can teach teamwork and human factors to interprofessional teams. Um, I picked this for a number of reasons. One, one is because it, uh, this, is, this is important to me. <laughs> this is a lot of the work that we do. Um, in my Sim Center, we're often working with um, uh, colleagues to help develop um, interprofessional teams and help them think about teamwork. Um, they looked at, 20,000 studies. Uh, and one of the things I love about reviews is that they do the work so we don't have to. <laughs> it's so valuable to have this kind of systematic approach uh, and to synthesize knowledge in a field. Um, they included 72 papers that have been published over the last 20 years. Um, and what was interesting is that they confirmed through their review of the literature that things like the development of human factor skills, that they're trainable skills. The evidence shows that we can actually train uh, colleagues to work together in ways that support and develop our patients. So we don't need to do more of that work. <laughs> One of the great things about this is we've got some evidence that shows that it works. Um, and we now can go about the work of, of implementing it. Um, the second example of a review that I'm uh, presenting today is from Daya and colleagues um, in the US who were looking at simulations to um, teach healthcare uh, learners behavioral risk 
behavioral skills around diversity, equity, and inclusion. Um, and uh, there's no um, there's no other way of saying it, but um, JEDI, um, DEI, uh, however, whatever sort of um, framing you put around issues of um, justice, diversity, equity, and inclusion, it's central to some of the work we're doing in healthcare, making um, uh, healthcare representative of the of the communities that we serve, um, supporting um, and opening access to um, healthcare professions. All of that is is really central to the work that we're doing in simulation. Um, in this case, they used a, a um, scoping review to map the terrain of the area, looking at what's already out there and where we need to go. And they included uh, 23 manuscripts in their review um, and developed some suggestions for what we need to do as simulation educators um, in order to uh, uh, um, use simulation to develop um, diversity, equity, and inclusion. So a really interesting piece. So where are we going as a field? That's a sample of what the landscape looks like. Um, where do we think we're going? Um, I always used to listen to um, speakers give a kind of, you know, this is where I think we should go in the future. And I always kind of went, oh, will we actually get there? Um, I'll never do that. And yet everyone wants to think about where where are we going? And, and I realized that actually what we want is to be inspired about where we should go. To think seriously about the potential for where we can go as a field. Um, so a few suggestions uh, and hopes for where we can go. I'll frame it that way. Uh, with Walter Epic, a, a, another simulation researcher, I published a piece um, in uh, 22, that was last year, um, around uh, where we think, one of the directions we think we should be going as a field. Um, and I was talking to uh, the team this morning here uh, about the notion that um, we really need to be thinking as a field about bringing in new lenses to look at the work that we're doing, new perspectives and new ways of thinking about the field. We need to move, I think, uh, and building on work from um, David Cook and, and others who, who make the, the point about health professions, education, literature more broadly, moving from justification studies, that is studies that prove that simulation works, towards clarification studies. How does it work? Why does it work? What's going on? What are the processes that are at work? Uh, we need to think very seriously about how we engage with theory. And that's theory about how we do what we do, why we do what we do, how we think that it works and trying those things out, operationalizing some of these ideas, using new methodological lenses and new methods to study simulation and, and, and to study different aspects of simulation across those themes from ourselves as faculty to our learners, to the processes that we use in simulation. I mentioned that 26% of those, or whatever the figure was, I think it's 26% of, of studies were tele-simulation or virtual simulation. And I think what was amazing during the pandemic for many of us was seeing how rapidly and um, uh, how, how rapidly we were able to switch to using technologies that mediate social interaction to various degrees of success and for um, various ends that we never would have considered it being an option before. And even though, as I said, obviously the pandemic is not over, but um, the social distancing uh, expectations have decreased, um, we are in an environment where that um, potential to engage with learners who are in the distributed setting still remains. Um, traveling to be in the same place is a luxury. And it's a luxury that is also uh, potentially problematic as we think about traveling large distances and an increasingly warming 
world. So we, we have to think about that. And I think the potential there is really significant. We're going to see that increase. Um, we're going to see that continue to develop. I think we saw in 2022 the first um, study looking at sustainability in simulation. So it's not a topic or an area that that has been uh, the focus of much simulation research. But I'm really interested in how we think about both sustainability within simulation and simulation as it relates to planetary health and global health. I think those are areas that we absolutely have to consider and think about and where we really need some of those different perspectives to help us think about the work that we're doing. Um, so this is an area that I hope we'll see quite a lot more of as well. We mentioned um, diversity, equity, inclusion, and justice, and I think this is an area that um, so it advances in simulation. We've launched a, an article collection and a call for research in this area and forthcoming. We have a, um, a, a um, an editorial by some colleagues who are uh, really, really pushing our thinking around what does it mean? What is what is justice, equity, inclusion, diversity? What do these concepts mean in the context of of simulation? Um, how are we thinking about simulation? in order to improve some of these um, goals uh, and to, in order to access some of these goals, in order to improve access to health professions, in order to um, uh, in order to create new relationships and more meaningful relationships with the communities that we serve. So I, I am hopeful that our field is heading in this direction. And then I think there's a, a real um, imperative for us to think about the notion of um, decolonization and shifting the balance of power um, as we uh, both as simulation educators and in the global um, simulation research and education community. Um, one of the things I often think about is that the simulation, uh, healthcare simulation in its early days was really an effort to sort of shake up the way we do things in healthcare, um, to reorient each other as healthcare practitioners vis-a-vis -vis our colleagues and vis-a-vis -vis our patients. And it's really important to me that we continue along that pathway, uh, that we are thinking about simulation as a as a, a means of continuing to redress the power imbalances that exist between each other as clinicians um, and between us and our patients, between our patients relative to each other. And I think there's a lot of potential there for us to do that, really to embrace that as a, as a challenge. So with that, I thank you very much for your time and uh, thank you for the invitation to help launch the SHARE initiative. I'm very excited to see where um, the initiative continues and, and grows, and I'm excited to work with you all um, in that process, so thank you. All right, thank you so much for your wonderful questions and comments. We really appreciate it. We really appreciate you being here today, uh, and I'm gonna hand over to uh, Professor Masume to, to give our closing. Thank you to our speakers, uh, to our audience online, Thank you to the, the Neurosciences Institute for letting us use their beautiful auditorium. Um, with no further ado, um, thank you very much for your closing. Greetings and thank you very much. And to say huge congratulations on this important launch of the Simulation in Healthcare for Africa Research and Education Initiative. Uh, as we know, simulation uh, offers us, as we've all said this afternoon, a new way of teaching, learning and research. But simulation in many ways isn't new. I think over the last uh, decade or two or three, we've all had an encounter with simulation in one way or another. But I think what's really special about today and what's really special about this initiative, it, it brings us to this critical point where we cannot ignore simulation going further. And so I really want to 
congratulate the team, the visionaries behind it, uh, Joe and Marvin, for, for this excellent work and this excellent initiative. And I'm hoping that at the end of this, we will see more and more of simulation and this this way of thinking and teaching into the curriculum. But I think I was especially intrigued about this idea of simulation science, because often we talk about simulation in the context of education and not enough about it in the context of science. And I think that's what you've offered us as well today. You also spoke about simulation and this idea of caring that we are interested in our patients, we are interested in having better outcomes, and that's why we have to go an extra mile and not be satisfied simply with the way that we're teaching. We also care about our outcomes. We live in a, on a, in a continent where we have some of the highest morbidities and mortalities across various conditions, and so it's important that we improve how we teach, uh, particularly to improve the care that we offer to the communities that we care about. But it's also about caring about, uh, about our healthcare workers, about clinicians, about doctors, and, and other clinicians as well, that the, the undergraduate and the postgraduate uh, training is, is there to teach you to become a competent, a confident uh, healthcare worker. And so simulation offers that and, and allows us to measure and evaluate and reduce some of those anxieties that will come along the way in the training. But also you spoke about performance, which is important, measuring, evaluating, uh, practicing, improving the performance of individuals as well as the performance of, of teams. I particularly have an interest in, in simulation. Uh, in, I wear two hats today. Uh, one in global surgery. Simulation is a recognized area uh, of practice in global surgery. It's been well recognized that to improve access to surgery and to improve the quality and safety of perioperative care, simulation is, is, is a recognized way and an important pillar of that. But I also chair the University of the Future uh, project here at the University of Cape Town which looks at improving uh, infrastructure and aligning infrastructure and services with the current and future ways of teaching. And so we can't think about how we will teach in the future without thinking about simulation and the type of equipment that we need, the type of laboratories that are required. I've had the privilege of, of visiting various simulation labs across the world. Uh, earlier this year, I visited a robotic simulation lab. It was nothing like I've ever seen before because I didn't know that these things uh, existed. It was obviously in a high income country where they had excess robots and enough to, to teach how to, how to practice with robots. But I've also been to other simulation labs where they've recreated the hospital setting and it literally made a replica of a casualty and ICU and really incredible ways of doing it. There's also in situ models of simulation where you don't necessarily, where you do and practice the simulation right there in the ward uh, where, the, where the patients, where the people, uh, where the frontline workers are. But there's also laboratories that are made of homemade equipment. And I think many of us can, that's what we can afford for now. But I'm just recognizing that, as I said, we cannot ignore simulation and education and research any further. And so it doesn't really matter which model you use, as long as you see that there's an important place for this uh, in, in practicing and in teaching going forward. Also, I want to thank our keynote speaker, um, Professor Gabriel Reddy, who I've also had a great opportunity to spend time with and also to learn from. And we really appreciate that we can learn from you, that you can learn from us, and this exchange of knowledge that's happening uh, right here this week and throughout the week as you're spending time with us. So I just want to echo a few words that were mentioned today, transcending boundaries in education, innovation and collaboration. And I just thought it's so inspiring for us to look beyond what we're doing and in what we want to see in the clinical setting, but to see this as a huge opportunity that could transform uh, perhaps the future of, of, of medicine as a whole. 
And also um, I'm thinking about the opportunities that were mentioned that we can look at simulation beyond the clinical disciplines and looking at planetary health, global health, public health, and perhaps looking at how to bring simulation uh, not just in the patient setting, but outside. I like the idea of, of, of looking at simulation uh, to harness the conversations that we have, not just conversations with patients and conversations with each other, but conversations with policy makers, with leaders, with decision makers. And so I would really encourage that we look at expanding how we do how we do simulation and incorporate it to the other disciplines as well. And I also like the idea of using it to decolonize the curriculum and not just decolonizing simulation as a practice, but decol using it to redress power imbalances and using it to, to learn how to have some of those uh, difficult conversations that come with when in places where we've got implicit bias that we have to deal with. So I'd like to leave us all with a challenge to say, going forward, how will we incorporate simulation into the work that we do as educators, as learners, as scientists? So thank you to everyone who's here and I'd like to wish you a great afternoon. Thank you to the visionaries who have created this platform and opportunity. Thank you to all who have joined online and inviting everyone to become of become a part of this network and for all of us to challenge ourselves to teach differently, not to stick to how we were taught, but to think differently about how we teach going forward. Thank you very much.